So Kristen, as a real estate attorney, how do you feel about agents compensation and these proposed rule changes that are coming up in July? I hear a lot, ah, agents make too much money and this and that. Like, how do you feel as an attorney? No, I definitely think that there's a need for change. I do think the way that agents are compensated is probably problematic when you look at the antitrust laws and the lack of competition, whether we're going to agree or not that fees are fixed or their standard comp- compensation or standard percentages or not. Um, as far as how much agents get paid, I think that really should be determined by the free market and what the parties are willing to accept and the consumers willing to pay. So I don't really have an opinion or a feeling either way on that, but I do think it benefits everybody to have a more competitive market. And I do think that was lacking in the way that traditionally compensation and commissions are, are done in real estate transactions. I understand. So in other words, the mechanism you don't have a particular issue with the amount of compensation, just like, you know, cause as somebody who sold out of real estate, I always found it interesting and I'm not suggesting you do this, but attorneys would reach out to us to talk about fees. And I'd be like, Hey bro, I didn't say anything about your fees. Like, what are you, <laughs> why are you talking to me about mine? Right? So, um, you have no issue with how much they get compensated. It's more so allowing the market to do what it does, which is, in the absence of value, the only thing to compete on is price. And if you are providing more value, then great. You can get compensated whatever the marketplace is willing to pay you. Is that right? Exactly. And th- that's really what I think is lacking here. So you could have two agents that provide vastly different amounts of value in a particular transaction, but how we have traditionally paid agents, their compensation would either be the same or very similar. And so that's where I think the issue lies. I I think the market dictates how much agents get paid. I think the value and the service they provide. And I also think the consumer and how much they value professional service and convenience and things of that nature is going to all determine how much they get paid. And so I I think you're exactly right in how you saw it up. Yeah. And it's, you know, whenever I say this, uh, to the Asian population, there's a lot of like, <sighs> like defending. And we talked about that and like, it's not really about like defending. It's more about educating at the same time. Like if you really stop and reflect what other profession could somebody who's brand new and just got a license, right. Who needed to get a 75 on a test, have a thousand bucks and not be a felon, make the same amount of money as me, who has sold 2000 properties in their career, uh, and you know, has been to the closing table that many times. And the answer is like none. So as an attorney, when you got out, I'm imagining you didn't make as much money as an attorney who's been doing it for like 20 years. Correct. Correct. And I mean, in my practice, we bill hourly and the state has regulations on fees being reasonable. And so as a first year attorney, what I could reasonably charge hourly is very different than what I can charge now as a 14 year attorney. Um, and that's, you know, how I think it should be. And with, with the real estate industry, you know, a lot of what I'm seeing is commission based industries do sometimes have it set up where regardless of your experience, the commission's the same, but that's typically when you're selling a product, not providing a service or a professional service. And so I do agree with what you just said, and it should absolutely be based on many different factors that make up the agent and the transaction and in the agreement, obviously, between consumer and and agent. Yeah. So so being that that's the case, I guess, from your perspective, as somebody who is a professional in a professional industry that does have regulations, having gone through that track yourself personally, You know, for someone like me who has that track record already, who has over 500 five star reviews, who can demonstrate value, not just nonsensically with marketing words, but actually practically and tangibly, right? What would you suggest for, you know, agents that perhaps don't have that? Because they're going to have to start not only having conversations, which I've been having forever from the listing perspective, which is, Hey, here's the products and services that I provide you with. Here's the compensation that you're going to pay me to do that. And here's what we're going to do for you. Are you clear on that? Yes, I need you to sign this agreement. They're going to have to start doing that on the buy side. And what I'm aware of is that most agents industry wide are very buy side heavy, like 60 to 80% of their deals are buy side deals. They've never had to do a formal presentation and they've never had to demonstrate value or ask for money. So what would you suggest to those agents? I know that there's one component, which you know, is the legal component in terms of documentation, how to document that. 
The second is, is from a business perspective, because you have to sit down with people all the time and like say, hey, here's how I value. Here's the conversation. Are we clear? Yes. Sign this agreement. Sure. And so, you know, when I started my law firm, I was a five-year attorney. And so I didn't have the experience. I couldn't say I've been doing this for 20 years. Like I know exactly how it's going to go, but how I did it and how I think that newer agents or maybe less experienced agents could approach it is I'm young. I'm hungry. I am going to hustle. Like you are my most important client. You are my biggest deal. That guy that's been doing it over there for 20 years, you're probably one of his smallest deals and you're going to take priority that way. Like I'm part of a team. I'm part of a brokerage. I can find the answers for you, but I'm going to hustle for you and really treat this like this is my top priority. And that's what I did. I mean, in a lot of times what I've learned is you know, obviously the expertise and the ability to provide the service is very important. And agents have resources, like they can partner with attorneys. They have maybe a team or a broker that can provide those for them. But people really just want to know, like, you're going to do what you you say you're going to do, and you're going to do it when you tell me you're going to do it. So a lot of times if I have a question or if a client has a question, they just want a response from me, even if the response is, I got your question. I'm going to do some research and I will get back to you tomorrow on this. That's perfectly fine versus you being able to spit out a substantive answer on the fly. So that's how I approached it. And that's how I really think that some of these maybe less experienced agents can approach it because I mean, all buyers, all consumers, they're going to value different things. They're going to have different budgets. So maybe somebody wants the 20 year agent with all of the experience, but that's not within their budget. And so there's a place for everybody. Everybody can make it if they're willing to, you know, put in the work, pivot, make the changes and be creative in a sense to, to sell themselves to these consumers. Yeah. I think that's spot on. Like when I'm reflecting back initially, when I was initially going on appointments and didn't have that track record. I did the exact same thing. And it's interesting because then in the marketplace, that's what people, when, if I'm in a competitive situation, that's what they try to feed the seller to get them to choose them versus me. Like, Oh man, Aaron's really busy, bro. Like you're just going to get his assistant. (laughs) So what's fantastic about this is this is the, um, competitive, you know, of course we're going to do it with integrity and straightforward and we're not going to bash anybody, but like, this is competitive aspect of business. Right. And to your point, there's a place for everyone. We were talking before we got started that, um, you know, an analogy I've been giving agents regularly is like, when you go on a plane, you have choices. You can sit in the back in spirit and you know what that experience is going to be. It's not going to be great. And it's cheap though. Or you can get some leg room and you pay some more money for that. And I'll see, you know, maybe with some leg room, you pay some more money for that. Or you can sit up front and, you know, what I've been asking agents is, is like, Hey, how many times have you been on a plane and first class is empty? Never. It's like, well, wait a minute. They, they have cheaper options at their disposal, but it's like, yeah, there's a certain segment of the population that will pay for convenience. will pay for comfort. will pay for speed, right? First on the plane, first off, like that sort of thing. And that's okay. That's capitalism. And nobody freaks out about that. Like it's perfectly all right. So I think to your point, one of the things that agents have to decide because there will be an explosion, which I'm curious to see from your perspective in terms of creativity and what you're hearing from brokers asking you to draft up agreements and things of that nature uh, in terms of different compensation for different forms of representation. You have to decide where you're going to be in that value chain. So are you going to be Nordstrom's where it's like, yo, we don't do Walmart. Okay. Like if you want Walmart, that's not us. I can point you to Walmart. It's cool. Right. Or are you going to be a Walmart? And say like, yeah, we will do a, let's say for representation, uh, a flat fee of whatever that is, you know, whatever that number is, six, seven, 8,000 bucks, independent of purchase and sales price. And we will do five or six of those a month. And that's how we'll make money. Sure. And, and there's a market for both of those, right? So as an agent, you just have to be comfortable that if you are going to say, I'm going to be the Nordstrom, I'm going to charge higher, I'm going to provide a better service. You have to be okay with a consumer looking for a Walmart saying no to you. Like you have to be okay losing that buyer or that listing or whatever. And same with if you, you're going to be the Walmart, I'm going to do it more on a volume base. I'm going to provide, um, you know, more cost effective services, you have to be okay with people wanting more experience or better service saying no and, and walking. There's, there's consumers for every, 
both of those options and everywhere in between. So um, I think that's definitely part of it. You have to decide your value. You have to decide what you're going to provide and stick with that. Don't try to pivot to be what every single buyer or consumer wants because you're never going to be able to be that for everybody. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, I've had a coaching business for a decade, teaching agents how to sell real estate in high volume. And I tell them regularly, like, if you don't have a competitive advantage, don't compete. And, you know, people try to be like, well, my competitive advantage is I put the clients first. I'm like, guys, everybody says that. That is not a competitive advantage. Or they're like, I'm honest. I'm like, no, <laughs> that is not like, that is not a competitive advantage. So as an agent, A, I have to think about, okay, where do I fit in that ecosystem? And there's no shame or blame or whatever about where you are, whatever you want to be, do that and do you. The second is though, is actually coming up with a very clear and concise value proposition of what you're going to be offering. So here is my value. So like you were saying, if you're new, like, yo, here's my value. You're going to be uh, one of a handful of clients that I'm going to dedicate all of my time and energy to, right? It's concierge. Like I'll be at your disposal all the time. And like, I'm going to go to the inspections. I'm going to go to the appraisal. I'm going to get in the attic, like whatever you're going to do, like whatever your value proposition is. And then once you come up with that formal value proposition, and here's where I would like to get some insight from you. Now it's, you're going to have to have a conversation about, okay, cool. So we're, we're clear on the services that I'm going to be providing you with. Now I'd like to talk to you about compensation and how I get compensated. Cause there's some various different ways how that could happen. Would that be okay? And they're like, yeah, that's great. Well, the first option is, is that the seller and the listing agent will provide compensation for me. Great. The second option is, is they can offer us a concession, right? Cause we're still allowed to do that per the new rules in the multiple listing service. And you can use that concession towards the compensation for me, or you could use it towards your closing costs, which would free up capital to have compensation. The third option is if in the outside chance, they don't offer out anything, then you would be responsible for that compensation. Are you clear on how I get compensated? Yes. Do you still wish to proceed? Yes. I need you to sign this buyer broker's agreement. Would you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. And uh, I think this is another way that, you know, maybe some agents aren't happy about this change and happy about having to have this conversation up front with buyers, but it's going to protect both the consumer and the agent. I mean, how many agents end up working for months without any sort of compensation. The amount of procuring cause claims that we see, those are likely going to go down because, I mean, Agents should have been using buyer broker agreements all along anyway. I realize, at least in my area, the vast majority have not been. But I do think this is a positive change on both sides. Um, and that's exactly how the conversation should work. It shouldn't be, you know, here's the value I provide. Here's my compensation. Seller may pay it or not. And let me just slide this document over to you and you sign it. Because we all know that consumers aren't reading the contracts that they're signing. So the way you kind of broke that down is exactly how that conversation should go. And aside from the settlement agreement, if it gets approved, stating that the compensation has to be specific or it has to have a specific formula to get to the compensation, there's a lot of opportunity to customize you know, the services provided, how you're going to be paid, when you're going to be paid, you can be paid on an hourly basis and agree that you only owe it if we close. I mean, the sky's the limit as far as how agents can structure their pay with the exception of, of course, you can't say whatever seller's going to pay is my compensation. It has to be specific, but within those bounds, um, there's a lot of room for customization there. Yeah. And I think for people who are smart, hardworking and ambitious and entrepreneurial, I think it's like a pretty wonderful opportunity. And what's interesting about this is, um, you know, these are conversations that as, cause 80% of all of the transactions I did were on the listing side. So these were conversations that I would have all the time. Here's what, here's what my service is. Here's how I'm going to be compensated. They would want to negotiate a fee, want to negotiate what happens if I bring a buyer on the other side, right? If I represent both sides and we would come to a meeting in the minds up front, and what I've been telling people is that the only reason to your point, why buyers agents have not been getting buyer brokers agreements signed is because it wasn't mandatory. And so I asked them a question. I'm like, well, how many of you guys would ever input a listing in the multiple listing service without a listing agreement? And they're like, well, that would be ridiculous. I'm like, why? Cause it's mandatory. You have to have a listing agreement to input in multiple listing. I'm saying, so this is the same thing. 
it's really not that huge of a difference. I think it's different and anything we perceive to be, I think as humans, we're very much so wired for certainty and anything that's new is perceived to be like dangerous. So people like, you know, freak out about it. Um, at the same time, like it's really not that different. And I think the only reason why somebody would be scared, cause we were talking, I, I know you do a re- really good job on TikTok, and that's where I saw you and actually met you and kind of consume content. And we can talk about that, about how that's a way to actually preserve professional fees. Cause I know it is, okay. is, um, that there's been a lot of like emotional energy from attorneys from, and it's interesting. Cause I see as an industry, I was on this guy's podcast. Who's a, he's an investor and he's like, well, you know, why do you think there's animosity amongst like investors and like agents? I'm like, cause you guys talk crap all the time. That's why you always like, all right, Oh, an agent. I'm like, did I hop on your podcast? It's like, Oh, a wholesaler. You guys steal properties from people, make low priced offers on all my listings. I don't do that. Like what, <laughs> why is there this like, you know, or attorneys, which was interesting to me. Cause I would do like 50, 60 probate deals a year. So I'm not an attorney, but I'm very, very familiar with the legal aspect. And sometimes I would have to inform attorneys about homestead laws in the state of Florida. And like, mm-hmm. and I'd have to do it in a way that was like, listen, I'm going to defer to your judgment because you're the attorney. At the same time, we facilitate a lot of these transactions and here's the mechanism that we use. Does that make sense to you? <laughs> right? So I think part of it is like, you know, kind of that. And I'm sure you've got some super interesting like comments about it. Like, why do you think there's so much like defending and emotional energy around this? Sure. So I, I do think with the whole commission lawsuit and settlement with NAR that the real estate agents have taken a beating in, in the course of all of this, right? So I think that it's been very problematic the way that the media has been portraying settlement and what it does and what it doesn't do. I think there's a lot of misinformation being reported. I mean, when this, when I first heard about the settlement, I just did a Google search and I said, NAR settlement PDF, because I just wanted to see a copy of it. And the entire first page was all news articles and every single headline was incorrect. No more 6% commission. Real estate agents agree that they're not going to be paid 6% anymore. Like every single headline that I saw was factually inaccurate. And so I think in, and that's fueling the public that doesn't study this stuff. They're not within the real estate industry. And so this is the information that they're consuming and assuming is fact. And so now the public is saying, we don't have to pay agents anymore. We don't need agents anymore. We don't have to pay them 6% anymore. When none of that was the case before, nothing has really changed in that. But so I think the kind of vast misreporting and misinformation that's out there is creating a lot of backlash and a lot of hate toward agents. Um, a lot of it undeserved. Of course, you have the bad apple agents out there. But um, and so I think as a response to that, it's, you know, it's threatening their livelihood and the way they feed their families. And so, of course, it's going to be emotionally charged. It, it has gotten a bit out of hand, I think. But I think it really starts with how the media is portraying this. And so it's kind of shaping the general public's view of agents and what this settlement does and doesn't do in a way that's just not accurate. Yeah, I I agree completely. You know, I was telling somebody recently, it's very rare that on a particular, like, let's say like a news cycle that I'm an expert on what they're talking about. (laughs) It's like rare. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I know a bunch of stuff, a little bit about stuff, but like, it's very rare that I have like in-depth knowledge of something (laughs) where I can flat out be like, that is entirely a lie. That is not true at all. Right. And to your point where they're like, you know, the 6% is going away. I'm like, guys, you realize somebody right now can go and list their property for 300 bucks on the multiple listing service. Somebody right now could list with like a flat fee company for 1%. Somebody right now is listing properties at three or 4%, you know, that's full service. Like that is completely inaccurate that that was fixated in some way. It's always been where people had options and choices and the vast majority of them gravitate towards paying a little bit more. Like that's just the way it is because people are busy. It's a huge transaction. And you know, because you deal with people all the time, people think they're like completely logical and rational. They are not. They are emotional <laughs> beings. Okay. If we were all rational, you wouldn't have a job and I wouldn't have a job, right? Exactly. Like they are completely emotional. And this is the biggest purchase that they make. So they they want us involved. 
I think the other thing, and I'm curious to see your perspective on it too, you know, in thinking about this, we also find ourselves in an economic season in which inflation is very high for everyone. And what I feel like is like the media has presented agents as the evil bad person that's making all of this money while everybody else is having a hard time, which is completely not true because I know this statistic. In fact, that the average agent in the United States makes $72,000 a year and a manager at Taco Bell makes 70 in California. Wow. Like people think like all oh, agents are balling out of control. It's like, no, no, in an office that I left like two years ago, there were 130 agents in the office and only nine of them made more than a hundred thousand dollars a year. Like wow. it is not the case. Now, do I think the industry did themselves a disservice with clickbaity shows like million dollar real estate agent? Yes. Flashing all these commissions and agents acting like divas and making all this money. And <laughs> the perception is, is these people are balling where from my coaching company, I see on the back end that they don't actually make that much money when it all shakes out minus expenses. Right? So I, I, it, it kind of feels as though from an economic perspective, because things are difficult with inflation, which is actually the government's fault for printing too much money. Ta-da! If you understand the way, like, you know, money works. Yeah. Like everybody gets a check and we print billions upon billions of dollars endlessly that leads to the value of that going down and it's going to cost more money. It's, you need more of the dollars to buy the stuff that you were buying before. So when I see a government official be like, I'm calling on all agents to help people out. I want to <laughs> scream and be like, bro, stop <laughs> printing money. <laughs> I'm not the problem, dude. Like you're at the printing press. Like you're writing checks for $7 billion to pay off people's, uh, college like debts. You're funding all of this stuff with money that we don't have. That's what's causing inflation. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, a lot of what's going around is, well, we don't need agents. So we're going to save money because we don't need agents and people don't need agents. I mean, I just posted a video not too long ago, like as a real estate attorney, I could certainly purchase and sell a home all by myself and not pay an agent. Do I use agents? Yes, I do. Number one, because it's a service. Number two, because my time is better spent doing other things than coordinating showings and, you know, doing all of these kind of not ministerial administrative tasks, but a lot of these tasks that aren't going to make me the money that I could make focusing on my law practice. Um, there are, I don't know how to value a property. I don't know what my home is worth. I sure I could, you know, Google and figure out how to pull comps and all those things, but how much time is that going to take me versus what I would pay an agent. And so, you know, I think a lot of the kind of defensiveness comes around this whole idea, like, well, we don't even need real estate agents. Of course you don't. You don't need to hire, you know, somebody to service your pool or to mow your grass. But do you? Most people do um, because it's a service and you're, you know, you don't have to do it yourself, but also an agent's going to do a much better job than your typical home buyer or seller is going to do. And so I think it's a lot of things that contribute to what we're seeing. Certainly the economy and inflation is kind of, you know, people are feeling the stress and the pressure and that's going to make emotions rise even more as well. So I think it's just this whole kind of pressure system that's, you know, continuing to compress and it's all, it's all kind of blowing up right now. Yeah. It's super interesting. You know, I, it, what came up for me is I'm sure you get people all the time to tell you be like, Hey, I don't need an attorney. You're like, yeah, you don't. And then how many times do they come back to you because they did it themselves and screwed it up? And then they're like, yeah, Hey, can you help me now? And you're like, no, bro. Like that's a, you, it's a fully executed agreement. Like you should have paid a little bit of money to have me look at it ahead of time. Right. So we do see that all the time. You know, I tell people spend 500 to a thousand dollars to have an agreement properly drafted or properly reviewed. They don't want to do that. So six months later, they're now calling me to file a lawsuit because there was an ambiguity in the agreement and now they're fighting. Um, but what we also see a lot is we will part of what we provide in my law firm is we will draft purchase agreements for people. So I'm of the belief that buyers and sellers should have both a real estate agent and an attorney. That's typically not how it works here in Florida because we're not an attorney state, but that's what I think should happen. Um, and I have people all the time that say, hey, I'm going to list my home by owner. When I find a buyer, like, I just need you to do the contract. Can you do that? Yep, sure. Here's my flat fee. 
three months later, they're like, you know what? I haven't had one offer. Can you refer me to a real estate agent? (laughs) We see that a lot as well because people out there on social media are right. I'm not pulling comps for your house. I'm not doing showings for you. I'm not going to, you know, drive buyers around and show them homes. I'm not going to answer my phone at 10 o'clock at night to answer a random question about a real estate transaction. Like, they need both an agent and an attorney. And so it's interesting that I see it on the agent side as well. People think they're going to forego needing an agent, come straight to the attorney. There is so much of the process that I do not, I'm not willing to do. I don't care if you're going to pay my hourly rate to do it. I'm not doing it. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's super interesting that you have this very unique perspective in the sense that you deal with consumers, but also agents. So you can see very clearly the value that agents provide. And when people come to you and ask you to do it, you're like, nope, it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And I do believe that that marriage between the two is actually, um, it's really good because, you know, I, I always have to couch, even though I have a tremendous amount of experience, like I'm not an attorney, I just fill in contracts. I'm not, I don't have the capacity to draft them. And I would have to tell people like, listen, I'm not an attorney. My intention in sharing with you what I'm about to share with you is just based on my experience. My suggestion would be to you is after this conversation that you have a real estate attorney talk to you. And usually they would say like, yeah, what he said to you is like true. Right. But I think that that marriage between the two, to your point, like it, it clearly delineates the services that are being provided. And, um, it also takes a lot of the onus off me as an agent, because, you know, agents, I w- again, I was on this thing with th- these investors and they're talking about this like double dip program where they like offer agents commissions to get their offers accepted. I said, guys, can I ask you a question? They're like, yeah. I'm like, if we were in another industry and you try to give me money to get what you want, what is that called? And they're like a bribe. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what it's called. So I'm like, guys, like what I'm aware of is you. And, and they were like, yeah, but I, I'm like, bro, the flesh is weak. You're putting people in a extremely precarious situation where you're offering them more money to not do what is their job to do, which is to say to people like, listen, there's multiple offers that are on the table. I want to be clear. This other one, I am representing the buyer. I don't want that to influence your decision in any way. I want you to choose the one that is the best terms and conditions for you. Are we clear on that? Now I've had some sellers who are like, oh, well, are they pretty much the same? You're like, yeah. And they're like, which one are you going to make more money on? You're like, that one. They're like, well, choose that one then. You're like, okay. But as long as you're super transparent, so you have, I feel like agents, they're, it's like, it's put in this very interesting situation. And then for the vast majority of people, because I think if most people were put in that situation, it would cause them to perhaps do some things that, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like nobody's immune to that. Sure. But it puts agents in a really tough spot. So having an attorney involved, I think, is a clear delineation between the two. Now, the only challenge is, is having an attorney like you that understands the value of an agent and is respectful of that and is like, yeah, we're a team working together versus like, yeah, you're less than me. And, uh, you know, I'm not like, I don't think we can collaborate in any way. Sure. Sure. And, you know, one big issue that I see a lot here in Florida is we have agents practicing law on almost every single transaction. And I understand why, because they are in a difficult position. The consumer, their client wants them to handle every single aspect. They want them to be an expert in home inspections and construction. They want them to be an expert in the law. They want them to be an expert in title. They don't want to have to, they they want like a one-stop shop for everything in their agent and agents legally cannot be that. And so while, you know, oftentimes agents will have their disclosure forms, I'm not an attorney, those sorts of things that they sign at the beginning of, of representation, they, you know, they're kind of in conflict where I want to provide the best service possible. Um, with, I'm not really allowed to advise you on this, or you want this custom addendum drafted, there is no standard form for it. I'm not legally allowed, ethically allowed to draft this for you. You have to go see an attorney. And so um, it, it is, it, it makes it practically difficult, right? Because when you think of attorney, you're like, oh no, now I have to call and wait two weeks for an appointment. And then I got to pay thousands of dollars. I'm like, I can't do that. We're going to lose the deal. Um, so 
I do think it's difficult for people a lot of times to find an attorney that's the right fit, that understands the urgency of real estate transactions, that has legal services available that are both time sensitive and cost effective. Um, and, you know, we partner a lot with agents on that too. Like we are here if you need us kind of like an on call or, you know, as issues come up, if no issues come up, great, you handle the transaction. But realtors are put all the time in this position where they're having to make these decisions. Do I disappoint my client and, you know, honor my legal and ethical obligations or do I kind of operate in that gray area? And it, it bites, it bites agents in, you know, in the, you know, what all the time, because I see it in litigation. There's so many lawsuits that we file or have to defend because of an ambiguity in the contract that the agent drafted, um, meaning like customized language that they've drafted. Or I had one where the agent said, you know, don't worry about that. The seller didn't disclose it. They're a hundred percent liable. Buyer relied on that and closed. And turns out that wasn't something the seller had to disclose. And that was bad legal advice. So we do see it a lot. And I, I think that this, you know, kind of wrapping this all back to the whole NAR settlement, I think forcing the communication to be different on the front end with the client is going to be a really good thing in all of this. Yeah, I do. And then, you know, there's this thing that, you know, people are like, well, you know, like, first time home buyers, it's going to be harder for them, you know, to like buy a home now and this and that. And, you know, I find that super interesting as well, because I'm aware that there has definitely been a very hard push, concerted, intentional propaganda, if you even will, for a long time about owning a home and that it's an investment and that sort of thing. And really when you do the math on it, like it's not actually a good investment. Uh, mm -hmm. It is a forced savings account though. And, you know, we are, we, I say collectively, like as a society are notoriously not good at saving. Uh, we're good at consuming. So owning a home forces you to save money. And for most people, the vast majority of their net worth is tied up in the equity in their home. So I understand like wanting people to do that. I think we've lowered the barrier so low to do it. Like everybody should do it. You know what I mean? Where it borderlines on financial, like irresponsibility because you know, I'm sure you see at closings all the time, like people don't even have like 2000 bucks if something comes up and you're like, dude, you probably shouldn't buy a house. Like that's not. So I think if people have to save more, if people have to, um, you know, postpone purchasing, like it's okay to like, you know, kind of sacrifice to get something that you want over time. I don't think that that's bad. What is your perspective on that? So I 100% agree with you on that. However, I do think, I mean, in this world and especially in this country with the, you know, materialism and consumerism, I don't think that that is going to change because of this. I think that people are going to still try to find a way to stretch themselves to get the biggest house they can afford and, you know, would still have the nice car and the this and the that. Like, that's just our culture. And I don't see that shifting much at all, although from a financial perspective, it absolutely should shift. Um, and I, I say that because, you know, this is going to spur and create different, you know, AI technology type companies. And I've seen the lawyers that are like, I'm going to capitalize on this and I'm going to do a flat fee for the transaction, or I'm going to do a 1% for the transaction so that they can use me. I mean, there's going to be all of these other options that are going to start popping up that is going to allow people, I think, to, you know, to still get into these homes. And I mean, at the end of the day, I still think it makes a lot of sense in most cases for the seller to offer compensation to a buyer's agent. Like I really do. So, and that could still be the case. I, I do think we're going to see some shift there for sure. But um, financially, I think it's going to be uh, oftentimes in the seller's best interest to offer that. Maybe you up the purchase price by five or 10,000 and then you offer it. I mean, there are so many ways to maintain the seller's kind of net bottom line while providing compensation to an agent so that they know both sides are well represented that I think it still makes sense to, you know, for sellers to do that. Yeah. And what I've been explaining is, uh, that 
instead of defending, which I've seen a lot of stuff from agents like, Oh, you know, I work all these hours and don't you know who I am. And I got to deal with all these crazy people. And I'm like, I don't know why you think that's a good idea to be doing saying that like a media, but like, instead of defending, it should be educating on the economics and the advantages and disadvantages. So what I've been kind of coaching agents on is like, you know, now that we've come to an agreement, let's say about a listing presentation, I'm listing your home. Now that we've come to agreement in terms of products and service, I'm going to be providing in the professional fee for me to do that, whatever that percentage is or whatever we agreed to. Now it's time to have a conversation about compensation to a buyer and a buyer's agent and the, the advantages and disadvantages of providing that compensation. So we'll go over the options that you have and whatever you decide, I'm going to support you hundred percent. Fair enough. And they're like, sure. So I'm curious, have you heard, you know, some of this news with like NAR and stuff and they're like, well, yeah. And then you take their temperature. What have you heard? Instead of verbally vomiting, instead of like, like, here's how I'm pontificating. Like, what have you heard? Well, I heard something like, I mean, do I have to offer compensation? It's like, well, yeah, I know. I know it's a little bit confusing, right? Cause you're getting all this stuff from the media and I don't know about you, but like, it's very difficult for me and other topics to figure out what's actually true or not. And there's two rule changes that really actually affect you at all as a seller. So I'd like to review them with you. So you're clear on them. Would that be okay? Well, yeah. Well, the first one is, is that we're no longer able to make an offer of compensation in the multiple listing service. We still can make an offer of compensation, just not there. The second is, is that if a buyer's agent is working with a buyer, they need to enter into an agreement and be clear on the compensation and how that works. Make sense. They're like, yeah. So, the professional fee is in fact a tool that we use to market the property. Can I explain to you what I mean? Well, yeah. Well, let's imagine Kristen, there was you and your significant other, you guys are purchasing a property and there are 10 properties that you want to look at within a five mile radius of your geographic area. You want to be, and seven of them are offering out compensation to your buyer's agent in the form of a concession or a percentage of an agreed upon purchase and sales price. And three of them are offering out nothing as a buyer. Which properties do you think you would instruct your agent to show you first? One's offering compensation to your agent or one's offering nothing? And then, sh- and they'd be yeah. like, well, yeah, I mean, one's offer compensation. And then you tie it down by saying, why is that? Because if I can have it covered, like I won't have to pay for it. Exactly. So just by you saying that demonstrates that you recognize the professional fee is in fact a tool that we use to market the property. So now we can review the different options that you have. And again, whatever you decide, I'll support you. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, the first option is, is we offer out nothing. Now in doing so, as you just shared with me, we could end up affecting showings, which ultimately affects how much you can get. Now you do want to net the most, don't you, Kristen? Yes. Okay. You also shared with me, you guys want to, you know, make this sale happen in the next 120 days, which means we need to be under contract in the next 60 because it takes like 45, 60 days to close. So what would happen on the outside chance if we were still sitting here 120 days from now and it wasn't sold? You look at your house, that would be terrible, honey. We can't do that. Yep. So the, the other issue with offering out nothing is that it usually takes longer. So it really seems like based on what your goals are to net the most and do it in 60 days, that option wouldn't work for you, would it? Nope. Great. Second option is, is we can offer out a concession of some sort right? Because we're still allowed to do that in the multiple listing service. And the idea behind that is, is that the concession can go towards the compensation of, you know, the the buyer's agent, or it can go towards the buyer's closing costs, which would free up capital for them to be able to pay their buyer's agent. And what we're seeing as we kind of deal with this real time, you know, as it's working out in this price point, somewhere around 10, 12,000 bucks. The third option that we have at our disposal is what we've been doing for the last, you know, 50 years, is that we offer out a percentage of the agreed upon purchase and sales price with an acceptable offer. And in doing so, we broaden the exposure the most, which increases the chances that we'll get the most in the quickest amount of time. So here's my question to you guys. Based on what you're looking to accomplish and why, based on the time frame you'd like to make this happen in, which one of those two options do you think would serve you and your family best? And then shut up. And the vast majority of them will be like, well, honey, we really got to sell. Like, let's do it like a percentage. You'll be like, okay, great. What were you guys thinking? And then you come to an agreement and you're done. Right? Exactly. And I think that it's an interesting kind of question that's been posed in light of all of this NAR settlement talk is, you know, should a listing agent be kind of pre-negotiating that 
compensation amount that's going to be offered to a buyer's agent. And um, I 100% agree with kind of the presentation you just gave. I think that would be extremely effective. Um, but I think another kind of option that would be interesting is, is you're sitting down with your seller and you say, you know, you're going to pay me whatever it is, 3%. That's my professional fee. Um, I need to educate you that we may have an offer come where a buyer is going to ask us to pay for all or a portion of their agent's compensation. And we don't know what that buyer has agreed to pay their agent. They could have agreed to pay them 1%, 3%, 5%. We don't know. So to go to your seller and say, hey, I need you to agree to 6%. We're going to offer 3% to the buyer's agent and 3% is going to go to me. I would consider stating, you know, you're going to pay me 3% and you should keep an open mind to any offers that come in that include compensation. We may have offer offers that come in and don't include any sort of contributing compensation. And then we can have it run the board. So if we're kind of pre-negotiating like, hey, I'm going to need the ten to $12,000 or I'm going to need the 6%, that number could be completely irrelevant because we know that buyer's agents cannot get more than what they've pre-agreed to with their buyer. So if they've already agreed to 2%, that's all they can get. And I mean, that's good news to your seller if they were planning on more, but kind of leaving that open-ended and say like, even if your position right now, Mr. Seller, is I don't want to pay anything to the buyer's agent, my recommendation is that if I get any inquiries asking what are you offering buyer's agents or are you offering any compensation, the response should be my seller will consider all reasonable offers. Like make the offer. Because at the, at, at the end of the day, the bottom line net proceeds is what matters to the seller. How they get there should not matter unless they have some sort of like mental block. Like I'm not paying their agent there. That's a conflict of interest or whatever the case may be. Um, so I think that's also an interesting way to approach it with your sellers is let's not pre-negotiate what we're going to pay them. Let's just know that they could and likely will ask us to pay something. We don't know what that is. Let's keep an off, open mind. You know, maybe we, we say, we're going to counter at 5% more on the purchase price or $5,000 more on the purchase price. And I will pay you X number of dollars or X percentage for your agent. But as long as the numbers work out at the end of the day, how we get there should not matter on the seller side. Yeah, uh, that's an interesting point. And um, what it makes me think about is like in the commercial world, that's how they've done it forever. Exactly. So the listing, mm -hmm. the buyer's agent calls the listing agent, Yo, you guys offer compensation whatever, including your offer, they make an LOI, including their compensation. And then what I also foresee happening, because as a listing agent and having kind of listed a hundred homes a year for like 10 years in a row, people will pay for access. So if I help a seller self-discover how they need to position a property, so it's competitively positioned in the market where we get multiple offers, the probability that they're going to have to pay a bit like compensation, in my opinion, with a high degree of probability goes down dramatically because mm -hmm. We can, when you're in that situation, we can dictate terms and conditions. Hey, listen, we got multiple offers. Sellers decided to work with yours. Uh, all were presented, you know, and the seller decided to work with yours. And here's going to be our counter. We agree to all the terms and conditions, but we're not going to pay compensation. And then, shh, and with a super high degree of probability, if somebody wants access, because I've seen people, I'm sure you have, particularly, you know, in various different seasons of the real estate space. I've been selling real estate since 2006. So I saw it then. I saw it in 2020, 2021, people paying. 25, 50, 75, 100, removing con over ask price, removing appraisal contingencies, removing inspection contingencies. I don't remember because I was telling my wife, I'm like, this is ridiculous and completely financially irresponsible. Like when I saw people paying that much over and removing uh, like inspection contingencies, I was like, what are people doing? This is complete insanity. Yeah, it, it, we've, we've seen that too. I mean, sight unseen. $50,000 escrow deposits, like anything they could do to be that winning offer. And so the market's also going to dictate that, right? Um, I think it's, I think it should really be looked at on a case by case basis. You know, maybe it doesn't always make sense for a seller to offer compensation. In most cases, at least in our market right now, it probably does, but that's going to fluctuate with the market, with inflation, the overall economy, all of those sorts of factors. I agree. So, because I also saw, because I sold real estate in 2007, eight and nine, like you mean to tell me when <laughs> there were 20,000 homes for sale in Broward County, like you mean to tell me that somebody's not going to pay 9% to get their home sold? 100% they will. 
hundred percent right. <laughs> when, when it's tough or when it's, when it's, everything's flying off the shelf, like, you know, Lennar and builders, they stop paying commissions. <laughs> so it's very much so market dictated. The other thing that it made me think about as we're kind of triangulating ideas is as a listing agent, helping somebody to self-discover that by positioning a property competitively price-wise, it increases the probability, not only that we'll get multiple offers and best terms and conditions, but that we won't have to, like we can save money on the professional fee because we can dictate from a place of strength versus, you know, you get one offer and that's not the same dynamic. So then you can ask a question be like, well, is that the position that you want to be in? Well, yeah. Okay. So then we have a choice. We can either list it higher and see what happens and then increase the chances that we'll have to pay compensation or extra compensation, or you can position it more competitively in alignment with what buyers and sellers are agreeing or a little bit below get multiple offers and therefore be in a situation where we can negotiate from a position of strength, dictate terms and conditions, and perhaps save you some money on the professional fee. So based on what you're looking to accomplish and why, what do you think we should do? Now, if people are smart, hardworking, ambitious, the vast majority of the time, they're going to be like, well, yeah, let's do that. Sure. And I mean, kind of going back to one of your earlier points, like that's why education is so important. It's less about kind of defending your value and your worth and your years in the business and, you know, how hard you work and how you're going to answer the phone at midnight and all of those sorts of things. It's educating (laughs) on here's how this is going to impact your bottom line. Here's if your priority is time, like I need to get this sold by X date because I'm closing on a new construction house or I'm moving out of state or whatever it is. Like all of those things should be considered on a case by case basis. And then you respond to it by educating and letting them make the decision exactly how you just laid it out. That's exactly right. So really, um, but in order to do that, because the barrier to entry, you know, I've told people that NAR never had an incentive for there to be less agents actually incentivized to have as many as possible. Right. Because they get dues, right? So, you know, Charlie Munger said you have to be very careful how you incentivize people because it shapes behavior. So if your in, intention is to have as many people as possible, what you will do is make the barrier to entry as low as possible. I've always said for a long time, like, it would have made sense, like, you can't call yourself an agent unless you do, like, 20 deals a year. Then you'd be, like, a junior agent. Just, I mean, they have junior associate, like, junior, you know what I mean? Like, that's what it should be. But so um, I guess... From your perspective, do you perceive that a lot of agents, because 60 to 80% of them are buyer side heavy, so they're going to have to do a formal presentation demonstrating value. They do not possess the sales skills that I just deployed. And um, they're going to have to ask for money, which they've never had to do, like ever. Like sit down and be like, this is what it is. Like I'm asking you for money. Like, do you see. Uh, a lot of that Asian population just not being able to do that. I do. So, and I see that for a couple of reasons. So number one, the reason you just stated um, in kind of going back to that barrier to entry, like the real estate industry is unique in the sense that the barrier to entry is so low that you can have, you know, stay at home moms that want to do this on evenings and weekends. You can have part timers. You can have people doing it as a side hustle. You can, of course, have the people doing it as a full time career. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But with the level of kind of preparation and education and value proposition that you're going to have to include in that presentation moving forward. I also think that buyer's agents are going to see a hit in the amount of compensation they get per deal. Um, because of those things combined, I think we are going to see a lot of agents drop out. And that's probably going to be the agents that are more the part-timers, side hustle type of agents. Yeah, I agree. And I think that that's a net positive for the industry. Cause you know, it's just like, uh, you end up with just better agents and it's also a net positive for the consumer because the consumer see the consumer, which I'm imagining is true for you as well is like they operate under the false misperception that we all do the same thing with the same level of competency, with the same level of expertise. They're like, Oh, Christian, like, why should I hire you? Like attorneys are a dime a dozen. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> they, they don't understand that. Like, no, that's not actually what's true. So I think that as a result, uh, again, the consumer wins because they get a better quality agent that does understand economics, that actually does understand inflation, that can explain to you supply and demand dynamics, that can explain to you so you can make an educated decision and choice 
Not it's like, oh, it's my friend from church. And like, you know, I'm just going to hire them to help me sell my biggest asset that I own. It's like, well, I guess so, maybe. But it's probably not going to be the best idea. (laughs) Which is why competition is so important. I mean, this kind of just came full circle. This is why we need competition in the market. You know, I think a lot of agents out there are saying this is going to hurt buyers. They're going to have to spend more money. They're going to have to come out of pocket. But I think... as a whole, all agents, all consumers and the industry as a whole is going to benefit from these changes. Yeah, I agree. And then uh, what I also want to talk to you about briefly is because I think you do a really jo- good job of this. That's, that's where we connected. You know, on, I saw your stuff on TikTok and stuff and um, how trust, the formula for trust is familiarity plus predictability. So frequency equals familiarity. The more you see me, the more familiar you become with me. And predictability is what you referred to before is like, I can predict the results I can predict. So like if somebody hires me and they're like, well, why should I hire you? I'm like, well, you know, I've had the good fortune. I've helped over a hundred families, over a hundred families a year for the last 10 years in a row, you know, accomplish their goals and objectives. So now the predictability of the end result, plus the 500 reviews, like all of these ways are ways of demonstrating predictability. They're like, okay, if I hire this person, there's a super high good chance that I'm going to get exactly what I'm looking to get. Right. So, and I think that media is actually this like unbelievable tool to, cause business is like relationships plus value over time, but media allows you to compress the time that it takes to form a relationship because of the familiarity component. And they're seeing you a lot. Like I had a guy reach out to me, Kristen from YouTube. And he was like, Hey, I've watched a hundred hours of your content in the last 90 days. And I thought to myself, I was like, bro, I said to my wife, I'm like, how in the physical world, how much money and how long would it take for him to get a hundred hours with me? It might take like two years and a, and a meaningful amount of money, but it, it's, it compresses that into a 90 day cycle. And in that 90 day cycle, I can add crazy value in the form of education and like that sort of thing. So then when he reaches out to me, which I'm sure happens to you all the time, there's no like, why should I hire you? It's like, yeah, I'm ready to like, where do I like send me the contract? Like I'm ready to go. So how much do you think, I know clearly you're doing that. And you mentioned to me, it ended up being like 50% of your business. And as time progresses, and particularly, I think if you start doing some YouTube stuff, it'll like get bananas. Um, how much of that do you think is actually important for the agent of the future to be known as somebody who can be trusted, which means that I know that you have my best interest at heart and this formula of frequent, uh, of familiarity and predictability to be able to preserve professional fee. Sure. It, I think it is insanely valuable and crucial for agents to, um, to be doing social media and, you know, video content and things of that nature. Um, because think about it too. Not only does the consumer or the potential consumer get the ability to see your expertise and absorb your value and see you for a hundred hours or whatever it is, but you get to reach thousands and thousands and thousands of people for free as often as you want. And a lot of times we get a ton of business from, from social media. I'm a huge proponent of it. Um, it's a little bit tougher in the real estate agent world because there's so much more competition. Every single real estate agent has a social media account and they're posting their tours of their listings and those sorts of things. But a very small percentage, like probably less than 10% of those agents are providing valuable content on a consistent basis over a period of time. It's not hard to do, but it takes time and dedication and prioritizing that. Um, I mean, we get, I get people that kind of similar to your story, you know, I've watched every single video. I want to set up this LLC and I already know all about it because this is what you've said. And these are people that I'm like, I've never seen your name before. So that means you probably have never liked a video. You've never commented on a video. You've never sent me a message. You've never interacted with any of my content, but they're in the background consuming it all. So even agents that are like, oh, I post and I get three likes and it's just people are consuming your content that you have no idea exists. If you are consistent over time, and this is probably a little tangent, but when I started my TikTok, I... 
I'm not young enough to really like, I wasn't really into TikTok. I didn't know how to use it. I didn't know how to use the features, those sorts of things. And so I would follow accounts that said like, here's how you grow your TikTok. And I was seeing all of this advice. Like if you post three to five videos a day, every single day for 30 days, like watch, watch you get to 10,000 followers immediately. And I was like, all right, I'll do it. Like it's free. It costs my time, but it doesn't cost anything else. I'll do it. I went to 80,000 followers in the first like probably 30 to 60 days. Um, so your content can't be garbage. Your content needs to be valuable, whether it's entertainment or educational or whether, you know, it's funny or whatever it is. Um, but that frequency and consistency is so important and it's something that so few people are willing to do. And that's how you can really set yourself apart. Yeah. And I think the barriers to entry are two things. Like one is, I think it's a real understanding about what you just said, which is like, we live in a time where distribution's free. It used to cost me a lot of money and I had to be exceptionally talented to get on TV. I can go on YouTube whenever I want. Like, <laughs> um, it used to cost me a lot of money and like, you know, again, exceptionally talented or know somebody to get on the radio. Well, we're doing a form of that now. Right. And like 200 years ago, if I had a wild idea or like something that I want to tell people about, I was limited to the people in my village. <laughs> now I can use the internet to scour billions of people who are just into the way that I do it. And I don't need like this. I think people have the false misperception. Like you need this gigantic following to make like a, a good living. I don't believe it. I, I know that that's not true at all based on, um, you know, my experience. I also think you mentioned something too, which I think is very important is I think the vast majority of people, I, I don't even want to call it social media anymore. It's just media hmm. because people are still doing it on the social graph because that's what Facebook was. They're like, they would connect you to what your friends were doing. But what TikTok did is it put it on the interest graph. Mm -hmm. It only shows you stuff that you're interested in based on what you viewed previously. And most people are still doing social. They're taking pictures of themselves at barbecues. Here's my food. Here's what I'm doing. La, 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 la. Like they're doing it completely <laughs> wrong. It's no longer social. It's just media. And when I tell people like, well, if you think of a media company, like, what do you think of? And they're like, well, I think of Disney. I'm like, yeah, the news. Cause that's pretty much like entertainment, right? I'm like, yeah. So what do they do? They do information or education with entertainment. Mm -hmm. So I call it like value tainment. It's like valuable information. It's entertaining. But I think the challenge is, is like, um, to your point, like the way that I perceive it is it's like a, a personal brand insulates you from market changes. And the thing that actually really takes place and the real value of the media is that the audience compounds over time. Not only does it work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but it just keeps getting bigger. And as it gets bigger and bigger, you can monetize that in all different types of ways, whether it's in your business, whether it's affiliates, whether it's like all these different types of programs. So I'm in complete agreement with you. I think you do an awesome job and uh, I've enjoyed this conversation. I hope you have as well. So if people are interested in your services in Tampa or wherever you do business, where can they find you? Sure. All of our contact inf information is on our website, which is Martinez law, F L A as in Florida.com. Awesome. We'll keep up the great work. I'll be checking it out on TikTok and uh, look forward to connecting soon. I appreciate you. Thanks so much. I wanted to get everybody together to have this conversation with you guys. We have about 90 years of real estate experience in the real estate business. We all came from various different backgrounds, different geographic locations. 